What's up guys? So for this video I kind of thought it might be interesting to talk about the world and ideologies of 1984. And so basically lately there's been a lot of talk as well as increase in sales in the book of 1984 and as well as renewed interest in the book and the two classic films, particularly the one that starred um, um, Mr. Hurt, who uh, passed away tragically um, a few months ago from cancer. Um, but in case you have, mainly th there's been this renewed interest because of, you know, world governments becoming more, t more autocratic, if not even very fascist, um, elections that have come close or even have even elected autocratic people like Donald Trump and it's one of those things that this whole idea of 1984 becoming a reality and dystopia becoming a reality is you know definitely a present sort of threat that a lot of people feel so I thought this video was kind of appropriate given the renewed interest in big of 1984 recently to just kind of give light to the situations. So basically, in case you don't know what 1984 is, it pretty much is a story that revolves around a, at the time, a distant future, but keep in mind the book was written in the 40s and 50s, of a distant future, 1984, where basically totalitarianism just reigns supreme. It is basically the ideology that, you know, is present throughout the three main super states, um, Oceania, East Asia, and Eurasia, who fight over the Equatorial Front, which is basically Africa and um, the Middle East. Sound familiar? Basically, the, uh, the main character, Winston Smith, is the character who lives in this world and lives in the super state of Oceania in former Great Britain, now known as Airstrip 1. And Winston basically, he hates the party, which is the entity that controls everything. He hates Big Brother, who's the, you know, the dictator that basically runs everything, everything. although Big Brother may or may not exist. It, it does, there's only mentions of Big Brother, there's never an actual Big Brother that's present. Um, but essentially he, um, in this, this dystopian sort of thing, he begins to read, uh, this thing that's put in the, uh, within the text of the, of the Newspeak dictionary, when I mean, Newspeak is now the new version of English. Think of it as basically a short-handing words and stuff like that. But actually, it's state mandated. Like you, you eventually, like new words come into into being, like double think and thought crime and stuff like that. So basically, Winston um, he starts reading this tenth edition. But within the tenth edition is a character named Emmanuel Goldstein, who is uh, the traitor, the enemy of the state. And in this thing is his theory of oligarchical collectivism, which is a philosophy of the party and it basically describes you know what the party's like it describes Eurasia and East Asia and how to constantly keep you know the people distracted and everything else there always has to be some sort of conflict going on and to be honest the war itself might not actually exist it might just be simply the, the government shooting off missiles to bomb its own people to give the presence that you know, there's still a war going on. And um, so essentially, Oceania comprises the Western Hemisphere, Australia, New Zealand, and England. Eurasia comprises Europe and, you know, and Russia and its former satellite states. And East Asia basically comprises China, Korea, Japan, um, and some of the other Asian states. And basically, the Equatorial Front is all the other states that are, you know, basically up for grabs. And each of these, these countries has, you know, their own type of totalitarian government, 
etc. Uh, Eurasia's capital is in Moscow. Uh, Oceania's capital is in former London, or whatever the hell it's called there. And uh, East Asia's capital is um, believed by many to be in like Japan or someplace. But essentially, the first um, major thing we're going to talk about is Oceania, since it's the more highly talked about place. It's the home of the protagonist. So Oceania is ruled by the party, which is um, the English Socialist Party, or whatever you want to call it, or simply just the party. And English Socialism is the, or Ingsoc, is basically the Orwellian type of ideology that runs the party, that runs everything. So, um, basically English Socialism in the world of 1984 is more, it is basically starts off as basically a socialist sort of scenario, I believe. But once the party develops, it becomes into, it comes into power, it becomes very dystopian. And it twists everything a lot to the point where the party is only interested in maintaining and holding power. Its interests is pretty much self, you know, it, it, it's only, it's only, um, its lifeblood is just maintaining its authority. So, basically, that's where the idea of oligarchical collectivism comes in. And collectivism itself has been a socialist practice, but the idea is that you get rid of the oligarchy, you get rid of, you know, the, you get rid of the class elitism, the bourgeois elitism that exists within it. So, essentially, collectivism is opposed to privatization is the idea of where Everybody, you know, gets what they, you know, gets what they need, and, you know, you're basically taken care of by the state. You know, everything is nationalized by the state, and you, you know, your wants and needs are basically taken care of. But under oligarchical collectivism, that's not the case. Everything is owned by the state, and, you know, people are, you know, given you know, housing, they're given rations of food, they're given things to survive, but the, but instead of it being a dictatorship of the proletariat, it becomes a dictatorship of the party itself. Instead of the people being the party, the party, you know, the party being for the people, the party is only self, you know, it, it's, it's selfish, and it only is you know, there to, you know, prop itself up and make itself look, look good, and basically, only the most well-educated, you know, only the people that have taken the most loyalist stance towards Big Brother and the party can achieve high-level positions, and typically, even in that case, you have to be born into some sort of position of power, or you have to basically, you know, come from a very well-off background. So, um, in that also, the inner party members, um, you know, they end up getting certain privileges, so it's kind of like that. But basically, the whole idea is, is that the party itself, Ingsoc, is based off of the idea of oligarchical collectivism, totalitarianism, and well, Big Brotherism. And Big Brotherism is basically nothing more than the undying, you know, devotion and, you know, cult of personality to Big Brother, you know, which, you know, some can argue is, you know, is this the same thing as like Stalin or Mao or even Kim Jong-un, but really, if anything, it's more, it's worse than actually Hitler. It was the cult of personality that was worse than, that's worse than Hitler, and so essentially this person is, uh, who's omnipresent, you know, omnipotent, basically the, their god, you know, it's one of those things where the whole ideology of Oceania, of Oceania's ruling party, is pretty much that of a dictatorship of the party. It's not for the people, it's completely, you know, everything being monitored, everything else. I mean, we, those of us that have read the book and seen the movie know what know this already. So essentially, Oceania 
is is basically a state trapped in this weird paradox where they're not really capitalist, they're not really socialist, they're not really anything, really. They're just people living in a very, very dystopian, in one of the most dystopian societies of the time. Now, that's not to say that the other countries aren't dystopian, aren't totalitarian, because they are. Um, but they're just not widely talked about. And so, essentially, these people are constantly, you know, pretty much, it, it takes the whole idea of counter-revolutionaryism out, out of the equation. It's like, there is, there is no real revolution, perpetual revolution. It's basically just perpetual purging. It's pretty much bent this whole idea of, you know, getting rid of any sort of statelessness, of any sort of, um, getting rid of any idea of statelessness, of uh, classlessness, because essentially instead of having, you know, the upper class, the middle class, the lower class, it tweaks everything, and their ideology basically is, is that the upper class is now the inner party, the outer party members are basically in the middle, and the proles are pretty much, to the proletariat is pretty much the lower class people that are still basically, that are pretty much forgotten at this point. So the whole ideology of Ingsoc, of, you know, the, of the party itself, is very totalitarian. It becomes very syncretic and, if I had to say anything, very phalangist, in a lot of senses nationalist, and very militarist. So it's definitely a, w would be a party that became very fascist in nature. And um, so that is basically Oceania. Then we have Eurasia, which basically is, their ideology is neo-Bolshevism. Now each of these ideologies that goes into it are all very similar in nature. They're all totalitarian, let's put it that way, and justly. They're all militarist, they're all nationalist, they're all, inter the, the governments are all in it for their own self-interest. When we go into the idea of Eurasia, basically it comprises the former Soviet states, including Russia, and all of, of um, Europe. So basically Russia invaded, so after the war, and all, the, the came World War III, all the, you know, Russia eventually just took over all of war-torn Europe, bing, bang, boom, Eurasia. And as you might imagine, imagine neo-Bolshevism became the sort of guiding philosophy and ideology of the time. Now, when we say neo-Bolshevism, typically we think of, you know, some sort of idea of maybe Stalin or some sort of, or Trotsky even. But really, um, neo-Bolshevism, there's really not even a defining term for it. Bolshevism itself was pretty much the provisional revolutionary action of, you know, overthrowing the capitalists, the monarchy, and moving Russia towards a socialist path, toward, you know, in Lenin's philosophies. It was pretty much the, the Bolshevik party then became the Communist Party. The Bolsheviks were basically just a group of, it was a collective of left-wing nationalists, if anything, that eventually just splintered off and the revolutionaries eventually gained power only to have Stalin kind of fuck everything up. Um, but really, the whole uh, Bolshevism itself wasn't entirely socialist. There was liberals, there was socialists, communists, anarchists even, you know, and even certain nationalists, right-wing nationalists that joined the cause because they felt that the only way to save Russia and move Russia forward was through, you know, Bolshevism, so they sided with the Bolsheviks. But once that goal objective of, obtain, of taking Russia, you know, for the people was acquired, that's when the whole idea of Bolshevism kind of petered out, and the people that gained uh, power were, of course, the revolutionary socialists and the communists. So, that's what that became. However, there was also, I would would say that there were certain neo-Bolsheviks that did survive, and hence why a lot of old Leninist people were purged from the party later on. 
and then came Stalin and, you know, reformism and blah, 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 blah. But basically neo-Bolshevism, it's hard to tie it in with what it could really be, but essentially neo-Bolshevism, much like English socialism, kind of goes the same route. And it's more the fact that the left-wing nationalists and even maybe right-wing nationalists never real, basically any ultra-nationalists, never really got purged for whatever reason. Um, you know, maybe Stalin died in an alternative reality or something, but, you know, but the point is, is that neo-Bolshevism maybe is a comparison of what we have would be national Bolshevism or Nazbols that we have today. We all know those astards. And basically, it's really kind of the same thing. Left, you know, some left and right wing nationalism, basically there's no real, you know, defining term for it. Essentially, like English socialism, it becomes very syncretic. And so, it, the idea is, is that, yeah, there's a lot of collectivism. You have people getting what they need to survive, but essentially, the ruling oligarchy, you know, in this case, their neo-Bolshevik party, whatever it is, gains power and it rules over Eurasia. So, and in a sense, neo-Bolshevism, national Bolshevism, is essentially the whole idea of pretty much that you nationalize, you know, everything under the state, but essentially, you know, instead of the people owning it, instead of, you know, whatever the case is where the you know, dictatorship of the proletariat is supreme, the government basically controls everything. The, you know, the party controls everything. And, you know, it, it just becomes a very interesting scenario. But basically, national Bolshevism is pretty much this whole ideology on pretty much what is reminiscent of the Nazis. Nazbols essentially... Um, they have the idea of Bolshevism, but they very much twist it in the sense, you know, that instead of having, you know, socialism, you end up having pretty much all-out fascism, totalitarianism. You know, it's very similar to that of, you know, in which, you know, certain ethnicities might be purged, such as, you know, Tatars and, um, you know, Jewish people and pe and even Siberians. It's one of those things where it is very, it is very much an idea that this could be a present thing where ethnic cleansing is a possibility in Eurasia. And not that some of this didn't possibly occur during the Soviet Union, but then again, it's much worse. It's on a much massive scale. So. You know, neo-Bolshevism could very much be more classically defined as Nazbol, as Nazbols, as national Bolshevism, because essentially it infuses the idea of nationalism into the whole idea of Bolshevik sort of, you know, takeover. This whole so neo-Bolshevist rule in East Asia is most likely, you know, like Oceania. It's probably very tightly controlled. Uh, mass surveillance, secret police, thought police, um, as well as just oligarchical collectivism, and it's probably also, but at the same uh, ranking, it's probably very much more nationalistic, definitely more militaristic, and possibly uh, worse purges, you know, even ethnic cleansing possibly could go on in this regime. So it pretty much Eurasia would make Oceania look like freaking Germany. Present day Germany. Not Nazi Germany, but whatever. Uh, um, the other uh, issue would be um, East Asia and the whole idea of the obliteration of the self or death worship. So, again, a very totalitarian sort of presence. It's not really clear as to what the government is. There's some speculation that they maybe have an emperor or some sort of similar situation uh, that Japan had, uh, Imperial Japan had, um, but essentially that it becomes more of a, um, 
a, a pan Asian sort of ideology, a pan Asian uh, government. In East Asia, the the idea, the best I could get out of that was that death worship or obliteration of the self means getting rid of the ego or basically getting rid of your whole idea of individualism, which again would go along with uh, neo-Bolshevism and um, Ingsoc, which is basically you're purged of any individuality. You have to conform to what the party says so or what the government tells you. So obliteration of the self, death worship, could essentially be the whole idea that you give up your um, your individuality. Your individuality is dead, and you basically, you know, your only your main loyalty, your your main goal as an individual yourself, is to give yourself and pledge undying loyalty to the ruler or to the ruling party. In this case, it is likely that under an emperor or whatever type of, you know, paramount leader that East Asia has, that there is a cult of personality, as well as the fact that the, whoever the leader is probably is some sort of cult-like spiritual leader. And the whole idea is, is that because Asia is known to be a very Buddhist place, you know, it's more most likely that they infuse the idea of totalitarianism in with Buddhism, and very much twist the I idea of you know, the teachings of Buddha and everything else to basically be like, it is your, you know, your spiritual duty to pray, you know, to praise the leader because he is, you know, the closest to, you know, to the God or to, you know, to the prophet, whatever. So the whole idea of obliteration of the self is that if this party, this leadership ends up basically they basically control everything through probably their own means of either, I wouldn't even say all oligarchical collectivism, more likely East Asia probably has a very nationalistic, para-fascist government, much like that of Imperial Japan. They probably are very militaristic, and, um, you know, I wouldn't even be surprised if in a lot, and it's very obvious that each of these states are very xenophobic. So, also, it wouldn't be surprising if in East Asia, like in Eurasia, there's not some possibility of ethnic cleansing, you know, possibly against, you know, whoever the minority group is, whether it be Koreans, Chinese, whatever. Somebody is, there's most likely rampant political corruption, political oppression, and just, just any means of opposition and anybody that's not deemed like fit or part of the, you know, or basically part of the superior Asian quality that, like, again, Imperial Japan had, it's most likely that, that, that they would be killed off. So that's probably where the whole, another part of that whole ideology comes in. But, again, this whole idea is, is that they have some sort of totalitarian, very nationalistic sort of government that would most likely reign. And obviously all three of these powers are vying for control over, you know, the Middle East and North Africa. Funny enough, kind of how, you know, the Western world, Russia, and even China, even now, are fighting over Africa and the Middle East. So it's very, there is a very interesting parallel to all this yeah but very thankfully we haven't gotten anywhere near the 1984 scenario i mean there are very very eerie similarities but we haven't gotten completely there yet but basically to recap to basically sum it all up all these each of these three super states are very totalitarian nationalistic in nature each of them have a very controlling uh, interest over their people and they only seem to be their only real main interest is keeping themselves in power and make sure that the people are either dumbed down or oppressed enough to basically not fight back or you know and it's so and each of these states most likely 
probably to some degree is lesser of the, of the three evils or even a worser of the three evils doesn't really matter. They're all dystopian. And in a world like 1984, you know, if I had my choice, I'd rather just shoot myself or I'd really just rather, you know, not be, I'd rather be an unperson. So it's one of those things where the, the ideologies are very hard to decipher. I mean, Ingsoc is pretty easy to go on since we have more information on it. Eurasia, not much, but there's still some talk about what, you know, goes on there. And East Asia is barely even talked about other than the fact that, you know, they end up being at war with them, you know. So it's, it's this always constant struggle. Another similarity before I end this would be the fact that you know, the West, or in this case, uh, Oceania, fighting against Eurasia, and then all of a sudden going against, uh, fighting against uh, East Asia. Well, it's very similar to how we used to continuously fight against the Russians, and now all of a sudden our, the Russians are our best friends. And now the people that we're going after is people like, you know, China and North Korea and these different little Asian states, as well as the fact that we have a really you know, boner sort of, you know, interest in Syria and certain places in the Middle East all of a sudden that we must go fight ISIS and we must go fight, the, you know, uh, put Bashar al-Assad out of power and da 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 So, you know, there are strange similarities and stuff like that, but thankfully we haven't gotten that far down the down the tubes yet to call ourselves dystopian but it is always fun to theorize so i wanted to basically kind of try a knack for that what do you think you know of this video what do you think of each of the ideologies do you have something you might add or even be able to correct me on post it in the comments send me a tweet and i hope you guys enjoyed it so i'm norcal nick leader of the revolutionist movement and this has been norcal corner Peace.